So this is the kind of thing maybe we think of when we're talking about crush injuries. Uh, you might also think of, of something along these lines. And there we go. Yeah. What was that? Crane tipped over, landed right on the van. Seven passengers confirmed dead at the scene. Yeah, look at this side view here. Oh, holy cow, that couldn't have lined up anymore. I know, I know. It's wrong place, wrong time, if ever there was a time. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Leave the house one second later, and that wouldn't happen, right? Okay, on that first photo with that guy in that machine, did you follow up with that? I could not find the story on it. No. Could not find it. And he's crushed but good. Yeah, no kidding. So... That's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we'll, we've got three main terms that I want to make sure we're, we're clear on what we're talking about when I use them, just to give them clear definitions. Crush injury, uh, crush syndrome, and compartment syndrome. We'll break those three apart in a moment. We won't get too deep into the anatomy and physiology of it, but there is a little bit that I think understanding it makes it really a lot easier to understand what's going on with these processes. And we'll talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms and then we've got a new protocol on crush injuries that's getting ready to come out. We'll talk about where that stands and what we need to do for these folks. So the reason why this is so important for us, especially when we've got combined uh, EMS and fire training, is because of this right here. You guys heard this expression before, death by rescue? Sometimes you'll also hear people refer to this as the smiling death. It's where you've got the person who's pinned, who's talking, completely lucid, vitals may be almost normal. That's it, yeah, as soon as you release that pressure, set them on the stretcher, boom, cardiac arrest. It's just, uh, it can be that fast. So we're gonna talk about why it is that that happens and what we can do to, to stave that off. So breaking those three terms down, crush injury, we're talking about the direct force, the localized injury, the part that was smashed and it can result in one or both of these syndromes, crush or compartment syndrome. Uh, crush syndrome is when the, uh, the isolated injury, its effects spread out throughout the body and have uh, some really devastating consequences, especially uh, organs like the heart, which is probably most uh, relevant for us pre-hospital, but also uh, longer term, and they say even more severe, is uh, kidney failure. And the key to this right here, death if not treated early and aggressively, that is, uh, that's probably the key word for this, early and aggressively. We're gonna treat these folks while they're still pinned or immobilized, whatever, before we release any kind of pressure. And aggressively, we're talking about a liter of fluid bolus before they're even let up out of the pressure. Uh, in addition to a bicarb bolus. And we'll, we'll talk more about that and when that actually becomes, uh, when it's time to do that. Compartment syndrome may or may not happen with crush injuries. You guys remember this. It's the localized injury uh, where the muscle starts to swell. And the problem with that is muscles in certain areas, they are encased in, uh, in fascia, which is basically swelling in an area that won't expand. So the muscle's swelling out. It can't, it'd be like if I handed you um, a, a balloon, wrapped it in duct tape, and said, here, inflate this, blow up this balloon. What kind of pressure are you going to be working against? Right? Yeah, some high pressure. And uh, the same thing happens there. And what do you think that high pressure does to the blood vessels inside that muscle? Yeah. It's going to... Exactly. Yeah, all kinds of very bad things. But yeah, blood flow through that muscle area is impaired. That causes lack of oxygen, and that lack of oxygen to the tissues eventually is gonna kill them. And obviously that can be limb-threatening, amputation can happen with that. But also, and this is a little bit further down the road from what we have to, to look at, but it can be life-threatening in terms of sepsis. And uh, to kind of explain why, imagine that there's no open injury along with whatever the, the crush injury was. 
and they go in, they get treated for compartment syndrome. Any guess as to why after they go home they're at risk of sepsis? And it's not always the case. It just depends on what they do to treat it. That was kind of a big hint. It does, uh, yeah, it, it, there is, uh, the necrosis is part of it. I mean, there's lots of stuff that really goes into it, increases the risk. But they say the biggest thing is actually what they do sometimes to treat uh, compartment syndrome, surgically. Fasciotomy, you guys ever heard of that? It's where they take a scalpel to that muscle and slice it open so it can just expand and not have the pressure on that muscle. Well, now you've got a gigantic gaping wound very, uh, very high risk of sepsis. So. so, like I said, I don't want to get too deep into the A and P, but uh, I think understanding just a few things here, mainly about this, the, uh, the sarcolemma, this is, basically you can think of it as the skin of the muscle fibers. And uh, its function it is like any other membrane where it keeps certain things inside the cell and other things out. Inside the muscles, in particular, we've got myoglobin, which is a fairly large particle. Uh, inside the cells, you've got potassium, a uh, higher concentration of potassium inside than outside. And all of that's good and dandy as long as it's inside the cells. When it gets out in, uh, in large quantities, that's when we get a big problem. So the problem with this occurs when that membrane is disrupted from an impact, a crush of some kind, pops those cells open, and uh, it's, it's kind of like those cells, when they're crushed, they pop open, all of their contents spray out. It's like if I had a room full of balloons here, full of confetti, and just started popping them, and all the stuff just sprayed out. That's what the cells are doing when they're crushed. And the big problem, though, with crush injuries is that because that pressure remains there and is restricting blood flow, the crushing force acts as a dam that's holding all of that, those contents of the cells there. They can't get flushed away by the blood. So they sit there, and then the cells around that are deprived of oxygen, they switch over to anaerobic metabolism. And, yep. And uh, what's a byproduct of anaer anaerobic metabolism? Like the acid. No oxygen, they're gonna eat something, and the stuff they eat produces acid. And that acid doesn't go away, it sits there too. It's not getting flushed. So you've got all of these cellular contents and acid sitting there, and those things sitting there bathing the other healthy cells, they start to uh, degrade and get killed off by all of that nasty stuff, and they pop open, spill their contents, and the cycle just keeps building and building and building. And the dam, that pressure is holding it back. And I put rhabdomyolysis here, that term, we've, we've heard it before, and uh, it goes part and parcel with all of this. Rhabdo is simply muscle cell destruction. That, that's all it is. It's destruction of muscle cell. All of us, everyone in this room has had rhabdo to some degree. If you've ever exercised, you've had rhabdo. It just might not have been the life-threatening kind. Uh, however, there are people, I've been surprised at how many people here have come to these classes and said they know someone who's been hospitalized for exercise-induced uh, rhabdo. It's pretty common in the CrossFit That's high, the words I've been hearing, yeah, it's a lot of that. people with real, um, high protein intakes and stuff like that, too. Yeah. They end up with rhabdo because of the um, muscles that are uh, releasing the, that all at one time. Yeah. That's what it does, and then it, it actually causes rhabdo to, to occur, and it's usually in people who, you know, are extreme athletes. Yeah, that's what, that's what I've been hearing, especially in, also in people who start into that CrossFit stuff when they've really been pretty sedentary before, and they don't keep themselves hydrated, and even worse, if they're popping energy drinks that help them become even more <laughs> dehydrated, and then, uh, yeah, it just increases their risk for this sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, so rhabdo, that's all it is. So you've got all this nasty stuff building up. The big problem, though, is when the dam is broken, and what we mean by that is the pressure is released, the blood is allowed to flow back through, and it's like the dam broke open, and now the blood returns, and it's flushing that big buildup of nasty stuff throughout the body. And that can be uh, detrimental to a number of organs. And that's, uh, yeah, kidneys especially. Liver, kidneys. 
Yep. And uh, among the effects, I mean, any of these things can happen with the cardiac arrhythmia and arrest, which is probably our biggest concern, kidney failure, and then so on here. And that's the point at which crush injury becomes crush syndrome. Can you get a little bit of that with mass trousers? Yes, and <laughs> believe it or not, mass trousers were, a, uh, were one of the things they found to be a culprit for this. Surprise, surprise. So, like I said, the heart, uh, heart issues are probably our biggest concern. And it's mainly because of this right here. Potassium. A lot of it inside the cells is fine, but when you get a ton of it in circulation hitting the heart all at once, very bad things happen. Exactly, yeah, up to and including death. So uh, for ALS folks, you might see some of these things on an ECG, you might not. Uh, but if you do see these things, you really need to have a high suspicion of uh, hyperkalemia or high potassium. Yeah, the big one right here, call that a P T wave, yep. But there are other things that can happen too. You can see the P waves start to flatten out or even disappear. The QRS uh, widens gradually as it worsens. But you can have ST elevation, you can have all kinds of things. It could even start with just bradycardia and an occasional PVC. They say that's, that's a pretty common early rhythm. Um, but Bunner branch blocks, all kinds of, just basically any bizarre ECG change uh, is a potential sign of uh, potassium. Yep. Yeah, the, and this right here, the potassium, that's what causes the cardiac arrhythmia and arrest is that sudden flood of potassium hitting the heart. We're not going to see that though until <clears throat> that objects off of them, right? And For, usually, out. right. So are we treating them with bicarb before that's off then? Yes. Because we probably won't see that, so we're just going to do preventative treatment. Exactly. There's, yeah, if we've got the mechanism and uh, the other indications to, to lead us to say, okay, this person's got a pretty good risk of this, we're going to treat them with fluid and bicarb before they are moved whatsoever. So would this be absent? You'd think so, and I thought so, but no. Loss of distal pulse with crush injuries is very, very rare. And the, part of the reason for that, if you think about it, what vessels are closer to the surface, veins or arteries? Veins. So the veins are easy to shut them off. They're relatively low pressure. So the arteries are still open, so blood's being pumped in, thus why you still have the uh, distal pulse, but it can't get back out to the heart because the veins are shut down, and that's where the, the problem really comes in. So the blood gets there, it just doesn't move. The reason I ask that, we have a Yeah. And that was my concern. It was Lincoln County had one up there it was mm -hmm. St. Charles County. Um, that was one of the things that I'd ask is to take the shoes off and check the dust pulses. Sure. Because of his position that he was in, that I was worried about what what that you, we couldn't tell because he was talking to us, he wasn't in pain. Oh and yeah. We don't know right. what all was going on and they were comfortable because the distant pulses were present this. They didn't even start an IV until we had <clears throat> Yeah. How long was he there? Well, I mean, it, they called us after they already got on the scene. That was probably a 14, 15 minute response for us, and they called us. It was a half hour, so he was probably in there an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, you know, the, the whole crush syndrome thing is, it's something that is a lot more common than what we may think uh, from what I've been finding. In fact, I'd venture to say that everybody in this room has had a patient with it. We just had no idea. It's just one of those things that it's, uh, it's just not acknowledged much. And a lot of it is because a lot of the big effects don't take place until hours, days, or even a couple weeks after we've dropped these people off at the hospital. So, but the, the thing is, what we do in the field before they're even released from the pressure has a direct correlation to whether or not they walk out of the hospital seven days later. 
and the problem is we don't get any feedback on that most of the time. We have no idea what happened to those people once we drop them off. So that's kind of why we're we're looking at this a little more seriously. So what so do we do you, for this? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. An ECG and 12 lead before release, and mainly so that after they're released, you can look at it again and see if there's been any changes that make you go, okay, I'm starting to see some signs of potassium popping up here. We need to treat for that. So if you've got those indications of hyperkalemia, the, the, the treatment's going to involve a lot of fluid, uh, sodium bicarb, we're talking about a full amp of that. Uh, albuterol and calcium are added in there for hyperkalemia. Why, why on earth would we give a person with high potassium a NEB treatment of albuterol? It, it does help if they, because you can have um, acute respiratory distress with, with it, but there's another reason. Flooding the lungs with toxins too, so you want to try to get as much of that out as possible. Yeah, it can help with that. The, in, in this one, I, I had completely forgotten this part. Albuterol actually does have an effect where it pushes potassium back inside cells. I had no clue. Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't know. Now, the effects of that are relatively limited. It, while they're on the NEB, it's working pretty well, but as soon as they run out, it, potassium levels start to come up again pretty quick. Uh, some protocols will actually say continuous NEB. Some will, others will say up to 10 milligrams of albuterol, so quite a bit of treatment pre-hospital. Uh, for us right now, we're, we've just got the one listed in there. It wouldn't be hard to, to justify doing another or getting orders for it if you needed to. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess probably the thinking on that is that our, most of our transports are going to be relatively short. We don't even carry something. Yeah, we don't currently, yeah. Oh, and then uh, calcium chloride. Why would we give calcium? Yeah, it's it's protectant of the heart. Exactly. Very good. Yeah, it does. It has an, it's kind of got an anti-potassium effect to it. You're not really trying to <clears throat> just trying to cope for it and that's that's part of the reason too why we want to give them a lot of fluid because that's what we're going to do to get rid of it And so we want to flush that potassium out with a lot of fluid. Uh, and speaking of fluid, which type of fluid do we want to give these folks? Well, why not lactate ringers? It's just sitting in there gathering dust. Oh, because it has potassium. Yeah, that might be a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, that might not help things out. Maybe it just has the wrong type of potassium. Let's try this other kind. <laughs> So uh, while the heart stuff is our biggest concern in the field, long term, the most prevalent delayed cause of death is acute renal failure. And uh, it's not a small portion of these folks that end up with it. For patients that have severe rhabdo-induced renal failure, 20% of those folks are going to die. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not benign at all. So why? Why renal failure? If you, uh, if you look at the, at the kidney, it's, it is. It acts as the filter of the fluid and things going through it. And normally, the fluid that passes through it gets, filters everything, and the fluid just passes on through that, uh, that tube, tubule there. It makes its way on out. You, uh, you urinate it, and it's gone. The problem with uh, crush syndrome, there's a number of reasons why the kidneys can't get the fluid through there anymore. You see that uh, image there, it looks like it's blocked. Well, it is. And the main reason is because of two of the substances that are released. One's the potassium, or one is myoglobin, 
The other is when it's combined with the acids. Those two join together, potassium and an acidic environment. Do you guys know what to do? Clump together. They precipitate right there inside the tubule. And so now you've still got fluid trying to pump into the kidney, but it can't get through, can't get out. So what's that due to the pressure inside the kidney? Yeah. And that right there uh, damages the kidneys. Plus, myoglobin itself is nephrotoxic. It's toxic to the kidneys on its own. Now, normally you break down some muscle cells. It's a small, steady stream, so you know your body can flush that out, uh, you know, pretty steadily. And your kidney, kidneys can handle that. But when you get that big, massive rush of it all at once, like you do with Crush syndrome, it, it's just more than it can take. Well, is there anything in the field that you can sign? <clears throat> <clears throat> well, that's yeah, that's all we can do. And you'll find when we get to talking about the signs and symptoms here, that's the really frustrating part is for us pre-hospital, there's no good way to know what's going on. It, it, there just isn't. Uh, but we'll we'll get to that. But that's a great question. It would be nice if we could know. So but, they will have. So that will cause decreased urine output. It would, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> and the other thing that it would cause fairly early on with the rhabdo is myoglobinuria, where you've got myoglobin in the urine, which changes the color. It's going to become much more concentrated. You know, they say when you're well hydrated, you're, you're going to pee clear. Well, when you're not, it starts to get more yellow, yellow, yellow. Well, when you've got myoglobin in the urine, it starts to go tea color, brown, purple, black, and, and it happens fairly early. So those would be indications too. <clears throat> but when's the last time you took a urine sample from a patient? Or when you asked for one? Oh, yeah, that's not happening. Yeah, probably not. Unless they pee on your cotton. Yeah, and then you, <laughs> then you just hold up to light. I believe that's tea colored, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so crush injuries. Here are some examples what you might think of. I was born and raised in Branson until I was 23, so uh, this image right here, that's every neighbor I ever had. Holding your car. Yeah. Yep. You can. You can. And the ambulance is standing by. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're getting ready to get under there. Hold my beer. Yeah. My beer. Watch this. Yeah. A lot of these folks are the same ones that had the, the car engines hanging by chains from the tree limb. Yep. And then when they mow their grass, they find two broken down cars. Yeah, it's pretty common down there. I can say that because I'm from there. All right, or, or you might have something like this as an example of crash. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, the uh, crash test dummy, he didn't make it. So. <laughs> but you can have crush without the crush. These little old ladies falling down, I can't get up. These folks are at risk of crush syndrome. Does anybody have a clue why? Could be. Their body weight is weighing on an extremity for That's exactly it. Their own body weight, putting pressure on dependent area or if they're laying on an arm or something. Uh, someone was telling me they had a patient that slipped in a bathtub, relatively young person, and was laying on their arm for an extended period of time. It was discolored when they got them up and crush syndrome was, was there. Um, <clears throat> but even if they're not laying on an extremity, just laying flat on your back on a hard surface for an extended period of time can result in this. So couldn't you get compartment syndrome with that too? So it, it's possible. Yeah. It's basically, a, I mean, if it's, if it's restricted <clears throat> for, for, for that goes. Yeah, it, it is possible. Get syndrome, yeah. It's just, you know, the underlying factors of what determines which crush injuries are going to get compartment and which won't, no, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's anybody's guess. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, you can have that. So that means any person with any etiology that can put you on your butt for an extended period of time, so any of these, have the potential to cause crush syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> Which of those on the screen there do you think is the most common etiology of crush syndrome worldwide? Alcohol. 
it is alcohol. I, I was totally surprised by that, but worldwide, alcohol is the number one cause of crush. Yep. So, I guess so. But yeah, and, and people have been asking me, wait a minute, people lay in bed for seven, eight hours a night. Why aren't they getting crushed? Well, that's the thing, soft surface for one. The other is having the ability to reposition yourself, rolling over from one side to the other. And if a person falls on a hard surface, if they're able to reposition themselves fairly well and fairly often, it's really not a big, big huge risk. But if they're not, for whatever reason, that's where the big risk starts to come in. So essentially anything that has potential to do these three things has the potential of causing crush syndrome. You've got anything that causes uh, compressive crushing force and then leads to a period of ischemia. <laughs> or if you need a more graphic visual, <clears throat> There's a guy under there. There's a guy under there. Yeah, bad day. And then ultimately reperfusion. The blood flow is restored, and it's that big flood of nasty stuff hitting the system. Isn't it always funny how in these videos of these uh, large waves, there's always some idiot that's standing five feet away from the water's edge? It's like, yeah, right. Hey, get the camera. Anyhow. But the end results in muscle damage and ensuing uh, crush syndrome. Now this might be an etiology you might not otherwise think of. Suspension trauma. Deer season starts September 15th. Yes siree. And these uh, safety harnesses are great, fantastic I idea. I wear them all the time. But I also carry two knives and I have a cell phone in a, zip, in a uh, zipper pouch so that if I fall, I'll be able to get to it. Now think about this. This guy's up there hunting. He climbs up into a stand and about 15 minutes into the hunt, he falls out and he's dangling like this. No one has any reason to suspect anything's going on. He's intentionally out there by himself. And no one starts to worry until maybe an hour or two after dark. So he could potentially be there. 12 plus hours. And the uh, same thing happens with these line workers. Now in these cases, they, like I said before with the others, they're completely lucid, they seem fine, but you pull them up, they put their feet down on, uh, on a surface, get the, the pressure uh, off their legs, cardiac arrest. It's happened a number of times. And uh, <clears throat> part of the problem is, is especially with these, when you've got these harnesses, that have the straps going across the groin like this. That pressure, the weight of their body on there shuts off some, uh, some blood vessels and the legs are a pretty big darn reservoir for blood. And it just sits there and basically gets stagnant. Don't they have those, those harnesses now that basically are around? They, and they do have the legs, but it supports more along the buttocks area? They might, the they, they might. Because I know they've changed a they lot in recent the years. A lot of those guys don't wear those anymore. It could be. It's, and it's a wider strap, too. Yeah, it's which is wider. good. I mean, they, they need to. Yeah, so. Anyway, that's, that's those. So it's possible that you may get somebody like this. Now, like I said, we're going to have to treat these people before we even move them. So imagine the fun of trying to get up there on this guy and start an IV and give him bicarb before you even lift him up or cut him down or whatever. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Adapt and overcome. See if you can get them lowered to <clears throat> about six inches above the ground. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then just put a trampoline under them or whatever and say, okay, okay we'll give you your treatment. Can you go back? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you dead the tree? No, I think they're even just posing that picture. And that's just a, like from a safety hunting safety site. <clears throat> yeah. I just long enough if I fell off the surface I could still get the ladder. Yeah. I could stand get back up. Yeah, no joke. Never happen. Never happen. Nope. Nope. Only the people who say it could happen to me are the ones that it could happen to, right? 
<laughs> yeah, that's why he doesn't hunt around here. Uh, so crush injuries and burns. This is the explanation why we've got these two topics here today together. Not just because Deb couldn't come up with more than an hour of, uh, of burn material. So, sorry, Deb, I'm just, you know, whatever. You know I could. Yeah, she could have, but we talked some sense into her. We had confidence. Yeah. <laughs> She's just efficient. She's efficient. All right. So, reason why these two go together is uh, because of burns destroying a lot of muscle tissue, especially with electrocution going through inside of the body, destroying muscle tissue, everything it passes, a lot of muscle damage at a very short period of time. Right there, you've got enough to cause crush. <clears throat> now this video, some of you I'm sure have probably seen it. it. This happened just a few months ago. But uh, take a look at this and um, see what you think here. Now, is that not one of the most teeth gritting things you've ever seen? Yeah, that is as awful as it comes. You know, this was the surprising part. I actually, I couldn't find any information on, uh, on this story. Yeah. You would, you would think that uh, about three weeks ago was like the latest news report on them, and it just simply said they're both in the hospital recovering. Wow. Wow. Yeah. She's lucky if she ever walks again. I know. That's immediately yeah, what I thought. She's into it, but never want to make her mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Her whole health and breathing had to be. Oh, I would think. Wow. Yeah. So how did that happen? <clears throat> Uh, they didn't say exactly, I mean, they, they were going to charge the driver with something. Uh, I, they didn't say if it was alcohol related or my thing, my thought was texting probably. Yeah. Um, but no, I don't, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so assessment, trying to find out who has these. This is like I said a moment ago, the, the really frustrating part of all of this is that signs and symptoms are almost non-existent for us. Very frustrating. You guys remember the, uh, the earthquake in Haiti back in 2010? So earthquakes is understandably where we get a lot of information on crush injuries all at one time. Uh, and they found in Haiti that the most common clinical signs of patients with crush syndrome, get this, abdominal pain generalized weakness and muscular pain independent of the crushed area. Okay, so that's it's, yeah, doesn't that just scream crush syndrome to you? No, not at all. And like I said, direct artery injury is rare, so pulses are usually intact. Yeah, and uh, you might have discolored urine, but chances are we're not going to assess for that. Some of this Harvey stuff down there is going to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's That process could do it too. So, now, how the heck are we supposed to know crush syndrome when we're looking at it? Assuming that they have it. Well, just by basically based upon the mechanism. That's everything. Mechanism. You guys got it. It's all about being suspicious based on the mechanism and the period of time. So right now our draft protocol is saying if they've been in, uh, in an immobile position or entrapped for more than one hour that we're going to start our, our basic treatment for this. Now that time period may change, you know, it's still in draft, um, <clears throat> but a lot of the protocols that I've seen from other services and research and such, they're, they're kind of all over the map. Um, but I will say that rhabdo can happen in less than 30 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and one hour, it is possible to have crush syndrome set in to where it has some effects. When you get to four to six hours of entrapment, there's going to be crush syndrome. Well, um, like I was saying before, you've got underlying, underlying history. A lot of factors. 
that factor into that as well. Right. The problem is, is it's kind of like you have on cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. have, you know, patients that have, are on shitloads of medication, they're, they're harder to get back than the patients who are not on shitloads of medication because yeah. you're, you're able to take them to convert them easier than you would with somebody who's on all these um, calcium channel blockers or, or beta blockers or whatever. Exactly. So, yeah, it, it is. It's just, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of underlying factors there that we can't take all of them into account. But definitely, this is kind of where we're leaning right now. Uh, anytime you've got the mechanism and that immobility for more than one hour, that's when we're going to think about treating. If in doubt, go ahead and lean on the side of treatment. Now, some people have asked me, well, wait a minute, bicarb, you know, because alkalosis is actually more difficult to treat than acidosis because you know if you if your body's acidotic your body can do some things to compensate for it like what's it do to your respiratory respiratory rate yeah start speeding up blow off more carbon dioxide compensate for the acid but what the heck does it do when you're you've got alkalosis going on what do you go down to breathing one time every three and a half minutes you know it there's just not a lot your body can do that being said, our protocol, when you see what we've got here specifically as far as dosages, <clears throat> is pretty conservative. It sounds like a lot, but it's uh, conservative compared to a lot of protocols I've seen. And uh, <clears throat> with that treatment, okay. <clears throat> so what we do for them, just going right back to just the basics here, the crush injury itself, you're going to manage that just like you would any other time. Splinting, bleeding control, pain medicine. <clears throat> and then when we get into talking about crush syndrome, this is where it's almost like a dance with fire and EMS working in concert together. Integrating care into the rescue. <clears throat> uh, this is where I think being in a position of uh, a fire and rescue would suck in one of these situations. If you get to one of these patients for whatever reason before EMS arrives and, and you're having to look this person in the eyes and they're begging you to get them out and you have to say I can't get you out right now. And then even when EMS is there and you're setting up your IV for the fluid and the bicarb, you're still having to tell them I can't get you out right now. I have to do this stuff first. Now, one thing you can do is explain to them that uh, you want to give them some pain medication before you move them. And, and you should, if, if possible, unless it's contraindicated. But uh, that's still, that's going to be a sucky spot to be in. But we have to just keep in mind that we may hate uh, having to go through that with them and having them hate us. But uh, if, we, if we help them by pulling them out, we're actually running the risk of killing them in the process. So no one wants good for them if they don't. All right, and yeah, we're going to hydrate these people until their eyeballs are floating. <clears throat> so before extrication, before anything happens, you're going to be taking care of IVs, two large bore, obviously normal saline. And part of the reason why we want two large bore is simply because of these two medications here, bicarb and calcium chloride. Why don't we want to give those in the same line? Yeah. Yep. They precipitate up together and block the line. Yep. Now, what, let's say you, you just for the life of you, you can't get anything but one line. Can you get both drugs still? Yes. Yeah. You gotta flush. Just flush the crap out of it. Yeah. And then uh, after release, you're going to continue fluids. Right now, we're looking at uh, for the initial fluid bolus before extrication to be about one liter bolus, an entire bag. And then after extrication, right now we're thinking 500 mLs per hour, uh, and then an infusion of, um, of more bicarb if we see signs of hyperkalemia start to develop, primarily through the ECG. And at the same time we see those signs of hyperkalemia, we throw in the albuterol and uh, calcium chloride. Watch the 12 lead and uh, treat for hypothermia because hypothermia actually, in, in all trauma, it greatly increases the risk of mortality. So you only get the albuterol if you 
you start to see the peak T waves and the yeah and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Now, do, is there a rule that like I assume that you want to stay away from the extremity that's been pinned. Yeah, I mean you it, you can. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I try to want to go uh, proximal to that injury site if possible. If you have an old lady that's lay, like stuck in between the toilet and the bathtub mm -hmm. on this arm. Right. You know, you're gonna you can start one more over here, but you're right. gonna start another one. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it's a little skinny old lady. Right. Yeah, I mean, that may be your only option. It may be one of those times where you only have one line to work with. Yeah. So. And EJ is closer to the heart, too, so. Yep. Yeah, I think to Kelsey until she's out of that spot. True. So True. Hopefully you can find some also in I.O. Yeah, that will. Yeah, there you go. An I.O. would work, too. Good point. Yeah, whatever you got to do. Um, and then I, d I don't have it up there, but also after extrication, if you're seeing signs of uh, hyperkalemia, you would also start an infusion of uh, the bicarb mixed with the fluid, a slower infusion. But if there's a, <clears throat> wouldn't you, just out of curiosity, wouldn't you mm -hmm. take an uh, <clears throat> injury, especially if there's an injury, stay, stay out of it? I.O. would probably be your last deal of choice, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm taking to stay away from that. The reason being is because it's going through a bone area and if it's mm -hmm. even if it's proximal to it even to you know, Oh it, yeah you I uh, the, you end up with all your drugs and everything else leaching into the into the yeah, area that you're just out in the tissues. Or or sitting behind that as a mm -hmm. roadblock as soon as you undo it it Exactly. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I wouldn't want to try an IO or, uh, if in doubt at all, I'd try to put it in an uninjured extremity. I mean, if you have to go to a, a leg that's uninjured and one arm, you know, whatever. As long as they're not going in the same vessels, the calcium and the, and the sodium, if at all possible. All right. <clears throat> and, of course... This uh, question always comes up in these classes, and it's a very valid question. People have been asking me, what if we've got someone with an entrapped leg, and before we release them, we put a tourniquet on them, right? And then we don't release all that nasty stuff. We get them to the hospital, and they can do a slow and controlled release over time. It it's, sounds like it makes sense, right? And, and really, it, it does. Um, the bottom line is that it's controversial. There, the evidence is kind of going both ways. What it basically boils down to is people arguing cost versus benefit. You know, which part is more important, the bad and the good over here or the bad and good over here? So at this point, um, I don't think that Dr. Shu is going to lean toward using the tourniquets. So this story comes from uh, Jim's article from several years ago. This guy here, uh, some bystanders find him hanging from this wall. Now, just looking at this picture without knowing the backstory, what do you think caused him to fall or to end up with his leg at the top of this uh, well, wall? You have a, he's escaping from somewhere or going over something he shouldn't have been going over because the Constantino wire or the, or the, uh, the wire on top, the razor wire, is uh, pretty much uh, given. Yeah, right. I mean, he, he was climbing a wall that he didn't belong on. Right. Okay. Well, that, 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 right you know, everybody asked that, and I did too the first time I saw the picture. You can't see it because of the low resolution, but his hand is pointing toward the cameraman saying, put down the camera and help me. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this picture was taken about five minutes before they called 911. So, anyway, yeah, so... Um, that's what it sounds like happened, okay? Keep that in mind. Uh, so bystanders are walking through here. I think this was in like Las Vegas. It was over 90 degrees out. And they find this guy. He's covered in his own feces. You can see that's, that's exactly what that is under him. He's been there a while. And you can even see, it's, hard, it's difficult to see, but his hand down here, when it gets out of the shadow, you can see that it's really dark red compared to the rest of his body. Uh, <clears throat> He is awake and alert. Um, 
it was not clearly determined how long you've been there, but they estimated it could have been anywhere from two to four days. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, <clears throat> so he's there, EMS, fire, police, they all get there, and uh, they get him down. And his vitals are actually relatively, uh, relatively okay. His blood pressure is 104 over 82, pulse was 114, respiratory rate 24. He was satting 96% on room air, and his end title is 42. Probably, <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> now, but those vitals, in and of themselves, anything really freak you out? It's, it kind of seems like he's maybe dehydrated, right. understandably. So they, they do. That's what the EMS, they treat him for uh, dehydration. They give him some fluids, <clears throat> and uh, they give him five milligrams of morphine because he's saying that his, his whole body aches and of, and of course his right foot hurts more than any of it which duh uh, they take him to the hospital his distal pulses are intact nurses find the same kind of things vitals all look good pulses intact nothing really streams out at them uh, and then the doctor says well let's get a, uh, a 12 lead and get some labs these are his labs Now, even if you're not really up on labs and what they mean, because a lot of them I had to look up again, it's been a while, you can see that uh, they're not in the normal range. His kidneys are pumped, they're failing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it goes into the... Yeah. Yeah, he's got, uh, he's got hypercalcemia, and we've got evidence of acidosis, We've got evidence of pretty extensive uh, muscle damage, and the kidneys are not doing a great job of filtering it out. Yeah, well, it's creatine Yeah. <clears throat> so, does that suggest crush syndrome? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but we don't have point of care lab tests and stuff in the ambulance at this point. Uh, now, this is that's a similar ECG to his. <clears throat> so, anything stand out to you? PTs. Got the peak T waves and YQRS. <laughs> yeah. Yep, absolutely. And then they uh, did a Foley in the ER. And the Foley calf bag looked like this. Yeah, that T yeah. colored. <clears throat> Yep. So he gets to spend uh, actually several weeks in the hospital. Uh, pretty rough course from, from what I understand. He's uh, in the hospital for two or three days in the ICU. The nurses come to check on him one morning and his lower right leg, the one had been, he'd been dangling from, is all of a sudden extremely painful. They touch it, it's firm to the touch, he screams bloody murder. You extend it all the way out, he screams bloody murder. What do you think is going on there? He's got compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome. That's exactly right. He's got swelling in that space that won't expand. It causes excruciating pain. Uh, the way the textbooks always used to describe it was pain out of proportion to the injury. In other words, like getting flicked in the back of the ear and feeling like you've got a watermelon coming out your urethra. Or ladies feeling like you're giving birth. It's kind of the same thing from what I've been told. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he's in the hospital, they find the compartment syndrome, and they end up having to take him to surgery for a uh, fasciotomy, and this is what fasciotomies look like. They just slice it open and it goes, whoosh, just pops open. And believe it or not, they do not suture these all the way closed uh, after treatment. In fact, they leave it open long enough and they end up having to do something like this. This is what it, one looks like healed. So it's never quite the same. <clears throat> so he's in there, he gets his fasciotomy, and, and then a number of weeks later he's released. He actually goes out the door, both legs. Uh, but, and this is, uh, by the way, this is his story of how he ended up in this predicament. He says, I was, uh, I, I went to pay this drug dealer $20 that I owed him, and even though I paid him, he and his boys, they jumped me 
they inject me with something to paralyze me and they hang me from this wall by my foot. And then they gave me something to make me crap myself. He had everything explained. Of course, he'd had a little bit of time to think it over. <laughs> but, How am I going to explain Yeah, this? yeah. He, everything makes perfect sense. It was later discovered that that was a complete lie. <laughs> but I know, I yeah. Like, I yeah, yeah, it didn't have anything to do with that. His history, he had like schizophrenia and uh, uh, his drug of choice was uh, methamphetamine, if you can believe it. Um, <clears throat> and this is what's really going to shock you about this guy. After he goes home from the hospital, brace yourselves. Some drugs. He, well, probably did. <laughs> He didn't follow through with his doctor's instructions to follow up. I know, I know, I can hear the shock in your voices. So that big, huge, gaping wound on his leg gets infected, and then he gets another trip back to the hospital for a little, uh, little slice and dice <clears throat> action here, and ends up like that. He sucked his <clears throat> Yeah. So. That's uh, not exactly a happy ending to a story. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say to make that happy. So <clears throat> in talking about compartment syndrome, this will be the last little piece of this. You guys may or may not remember the five Ps. They said these were the uh, classic hallmark signs of compartment syndrome. <clears throat> Do these uh, look kind of familiar? <clears throat> yeah. Now, the pain out of proportion to, <clears throat> to the injury, that's still the most reliable. But when they're still entrapped, they may only complain of, like, numbness, for example, or maybe mild pain. But it can ex ex um, increase to that severe pain rather quickly, although it's possible it might not even happen while they're in your presence. Uh, paresthesias, that numbness and tingling may or may not happen. Pallor actually isn't all that likely unless they're also uh, in shock from blood loss or, or some other reason. Pulselessness, like we said, least reliable, almost never happens, and when it does, it's late. And paralysis just depends on whether or not the nerves were damaged.